But when my constituent finds that he was overpaid tax credits in 1999, oh, yes. oh this uh, government yeah. are unstoppable. Oh, yeah. They will hound you down. Yeah. They will hunt you for £450 before they go after £4.5 billion. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Especially when a lot of it appears to have gone to your pals. This is a dangerous government making bad decisions on top of a global pandemic. But mind you, we shouldn't be surprised given the fact that they seem to have been pushed half the time at parties in number 10. <laughs> so as I said, there is an element of truth in that the war in Ukraine, for instance, has also... If she just say to the Honourable Lady, she really must not use language like that. Please don't. I, I hope you will apologise for... Were inebriated, intoxicated, they were paralytic at parties in number 10. Is that all right? Quite careful. Mary Black, continue. I, I don't see what I said that wasn't true, Madam Deputy Carry. Speaker, but I take, I take it, I take it. And I've lambasted the government for choosing to bomb Surrey instead of paying pensions. I've lambasted them for spending billions on Trident. I've eh, had a go at them for doing up this Palace of Westminster for £7 billion, which, funnily enough, we can afford. And I understand that sometimes that can get quite, quite dull, you know, when politicians repeat things again and again, but we've now got a new one. We can now also afford to pay up for the Queen's House. We can now find the money to refurbish Buckingham Palace. So my question to the Minister would be this. Are we going to be doing up Downing Street any time soon? Are there any, are there any other houses filled with millionaires that need to be done up, that need a lick of paint? Because it's a ridiculous notion that we can afford to fork out money for palaces, literal palaces like this in Buckingham Palace, but we can't pay pensions. It's a joke. <clears throat> now, our job in here is to represent our job, is to maintain democracy, to make sure that people watching at home feel as though they've got a voice, to make sure that they feel there's people listening and standing up for them. To see when you see the quality of the debate that we've just sat through, no wonder people are quite depressed and disillusioned with politics. We've debated this five times. We've had 240 petitions all across this House. People are affected by this. Now, every single person that handed in a, a petition has not just a professional duty, but a moral duty to walk through that lobby tonight and yeah, vote yeah. with us because if they don't, as my waspy mother would say, hell slap it into you the next election. Yeah. <laughs> the priority isn't the economy. It seems to be things like protecting freedom of speech and yet the Tories are the ones that have banned schools in England from using sources that are not overtly pro-capitalist. Yeah. They're cracking down on <clears throat> freedom of assembly and protest. They're privatising Channel 4 when the Culture Secretary didn't even know that Channel 4 receives no public money. <laughs> so the argument isn't financial. And as the member for Rhonda uh, touched upon earlier on, when we consider that the Culture Secretary was a key focus of a <laughs> Channel 4 documentary once about the influence that Christian <coughs> fundamentalism has over UK politics, yeah, it yeah. becomes even more concerning that this decision is political and it's personal, it is not professional. But most terrifying of all, Madam Deputy, is that this government literally want to get rid of the Human Rights Act. And that begs the question, for who do they think rights have gone too far? Mm. Do you know how scary it is to sit at home and wonder if it's you? Is it your rights that are up for grabs? We've witnessed Windrush, We've, our economic strategy is to open our doors to the rest of the world when we need their hard work and then chuck them out 50 years later without yeah. a word's yeah, notice. Yeah. We tell our own citizens that their safety can't be guaranteed in Rwanda, but we're perfectly happy to ship asylum seekers, people fleeing war and persecution over to Rwanda as though they're cattle to be dealt with by someone else. Mm -hmm. And despite knowing that this plan costs more than it will ever save, this is just little England elites drunk on the memory of a British empire that no longer exists. Yeah. May I actually just begin by saying genuinely how sorry I was to hear that the Honourable Lady will be standing down at the next election. She and I joined this House at the same time, and I know she has contributed much to her party and to this place. And may I also say, I'm sure she will wish to join me in celebrating His Majesty King Charles receiving the Scottish regalia. I think pretty much.
as we speak. There's, there's always time for a Damascan conversion, Mr. Speaker. But when, when, when it comes to the NHS, I will take absolutely no lecture from either party on it. It has been there for me. I was born in an NHS hospital. My children were born in an NHS hospital. It's been there for me and my family, and this government has put record funding into it. Very <laughs> black. The, the Deputy Prime Minister, I thank him for his kind words, and we did join this place at the same time, and I'm pretty sure we'll be leaving at the same time. <laughs> problem that faces the health service across these aisles is workforce and research shows that Brexit has worsened the UK's shortage of doctors. Yep. European nurses registering to work in the UK fell by 90% after the Brexit referendum. Wow. What more will it take for both him and the Labour Party to admit the damage that Brexit is causing our health services? Yeah. Yeah. When the Chancellor spoke in his budget about fixing the roof while the sun is shining, I would have to ask, on who is the sun shining? Yeah, 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 yeah. When he spoke yeah, yeah. about benefits not supporting certain kind of lifestyles, is that the kind of lifestyle that he was talking about? If we go back even further, when the Minister for Employment was asked to consider if there was a correlation between the number of sanctions and the rise in food bank use, she stated, and I quote, Food banks play an important role in local welfare provision. Renfrewshire has the third highest use of food bank use, and food bank use is going up and up. Food banks are not part of the welfare state. They are a symbol that the welfare state is failing. Now, the government, quite rightly, pays for me through taxpayers' money to be able to live in London whilst I serve my constituents. My housing is subsidised by the taxpayer. Now, the Chancellor in his budget said it is not fair that families earning over £40,000 in London should have their rents paid for by other working people. But it is OK so long as you're an MP. Yeah. <laughs> in this budget, the Chancellor also abolished any housing benefit for anyone below the age of 21. So we are now in the ridiculous situation whereby, because I am an MP, not only am I the youngest, but I am now also the only 20-year-old in the whole of the UK that the Chancellor is prepared to help with housing. <laughs> Over the last 12 years, I fear we are sleepwalking closer and closer to the F word. And I know everyone is scared to say it for fear of sounding over the top or being accused of going too far. But I say this with all sincerity. When I say the F word, I'm talking about fascism. Fascism wrapped in red, white and blue. And you may mock and you may disagree, but fascism does not come in with intentional evil plans or the introduction of leather jack boots. It doesn't happen like that. It happens subtly. It happens when we see self present No, I've heard enough. It happens when we see that governments making decisions based on self-preservation, based on cronyism, based on anything that will keep them in power. We see the concentration of power whilst avoiding any of the scrutiny or responsibility that comes with that power. It arrives under the guise of respectability and pride mm. that will then be refused to anyone who is deemed different. It arrives through the othering of people, the normalisation of human cruelty. Now, I don't know how far down that road we are, Madam Deputy Speaker. Time will tell, but the things we do in the name of economic growth, the warning signs are there for everyone else to see whether they admit it or not. This government plans to cut taxes for the richest, spend £6 billion imprisoning people fleeing war and persecution, yep. and has lost £21 billion to government fraud, fraud throughout this pandemic. Is the view from the Prime Minister's luxury helicopter so skewed that during a cost of living crisis yep, yep. he thinks this Absolutely. is what people's priorities are? Yep, yep, yep.
Now, I'm, I'm used to the, the abuse online in particular. I'm regularly called a, a wee boy. I'm told that I wear my dad's suits and stuff. You know, me, me and my pals actually laugh about it. That's how I cope about it. We find the best insults and that's how we have a laugh. But I struggle to see any joke in being systematically called a dyke, a rug muncher, a slut, a whore, a scruffy bint. I've been told that you can't put lipstick on a pig. Let the dirty bitch eat shit and die. I could soften some of this by talking about the C word, but the reality is there is no softening when you're targeted with these words and I'm left reading them on my screen every day, day in, day out. She needs a kick in the cunt, guttural cunt, ugly cunt, wee animal cunt. There is no softening just how sexualised and misogynistic the abuse is. I've got a comment from some guy, William Hanna, never heard of him in my life. I've pumped some ugly birds in my time, but I just wouldn't. Thank you, Mr Speaker. When the Prime Minister took office, he said he would put economic stability and confidence at the heart of this government. <laughs> Today, UK interest rates are one of the highest in the G20, and mortgage rates are rising nearly back to where they were after the former PM crashed the economy. Is it not the case that this government's biggest achievement is that they're trashing the economy just a wee bit slower than their predecessor? <laughs> after hearing the Labour leader's intentions to support the changes of tax credits that the Chancellor has put forward, I must make this plea through the words of one of your own and one of a personal hero of mine. Tony Benn once said, that in politics there are weathercocks and signposts. Weathercocks will spin in whatever direction the wind of public opinion may blow them, no matter what principle they have to compromise. And then there are signposts, signposts which stand true and tall and principled, and they point in a direction and they say, this is the way to a better society, and it is my job to convince you why. Tony Benn was right when he said the only people worth remembering in politics were signposts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah, yeah. yes, we will have political differences. Yes, in other parliaments we may be opposing parties, but within this chamber we are not. No matter how much I may wish it, the SNP is not the sole opposition to this government, <laughs> but nor is the Labour Party. Yeah. It is together with all the parties on these benches that we must form an opposition. And in order to be effective, we must oppose, not abstain. Yeah. So I reach out a genuine hand of friendship, which I can only hope will be taken. Let us come together. Let us be that opposition. Let us be that signpost of a better society.